to the Quimper Geological Society event. So great to have you all joining us here today. My name is Rebecca Koronowski and I am the Education and Engagement Manager at Jefferson Land Trust. Um, a fellow geologist and a wine enthusiast, and I am thrilled to be here today uh, to hear this presentation. So off the bat, I just want to give you all a couple of uh, pointers on tech for things that can be help th helpful throughout this event. Uh, so for the most part, we'll keep everyone uh, with their mics off uh, to give our speakers the floor. Um, some of you already have your videos on, however, which is great. It's always nice to see who's in the room. So in the bottom left hand corner of your screen, you can turn your video on or off depending on your comfort level or uh, if you'd like to show up uh, to say hello. And so that video looks like a, an old camcorder there. Additionally, in the upper right hand corner of your screen, there's an option to change the way that you view. Uh, so right now you may have it so that it's just my face showing up on your screen. Um, and if you go in the upper right hand corner, you can switch to gallery view so that you can see the rest of the folks in, a, in the room. If you're on a tablet or a phone, you can swipe left or right and that'll give you some different view options. Um, additionally, uh, it seems like a lot of you have already found it, but our chat function is the main way that we will uh, be communicating together um, in this event. And so on the bottom of your screen in the center, there's an icon for chat. And if you're on a tablet or a device, you may need to click the more menu in order to get to the chat function. And that's where uh, we'll have you all chime in, um, let us know what you're drinking and um, any other fun stuff that you want to share as we're going through. And additionally, this is where Michael and I will collect uh, questions to ask of Scott later during the Q and A. Um, yeah, and so if anybody has any questions related to tech or if things aren't working for you on your end, feel free to shoot a chat into the chat box there or send it directly to me um, and we'll get you all squared away. Finally, we are recording this session uh, for viewing at a later date. And so just so you know, um, we are recording and so you could share this with your friends afterwards, um, but do know that your video may be a part of that recording. So I think with that, I'll pass it on over to Michael Machette. Michael, are you able to unmute yourself there? I might need to change a setting for you. I got it. You've got it. Good. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Nope. I'm speaking. Scott hears me. Okay, you hear me. Okay, thanks. Welcome today. Uh, glad to see you could tear yourselves away from the Seahawks game, which is going on right now. I just looked at the score. It's 20 to 13 and the Rams are ahead. So don't cry in your wine. You can catch up on them later. For uh, those of you that are new to our lectures, we're the Quimper Geological Society, an, out an outreach group dealing with geology that's under the uh, arm and wings of the Jefferson Land Trust. Been around about 10 years. We give six or seven lectures per year and a couple field trips in the summer. You're welcome to attend all of them. They're usually free. There's a charge for the field trips, of course. Uh, we hope to get back to our regular schedule of on the in-person events sometime this year, but we're at the mercy of the COVID right now. So I wanna, um, Rebecca, can you bring up the upcoming talks? Uh, we've got a list of the upcoming things I wanna mention to you. You can see them on our website also. Uh, ben Goldfarb, a young but celebrated author from Spokane will speak about beavers and how they shape our landscape. That talk's going to be on February 27th. This was our introductory slide, Rebecca. Yeah, okay. Uh, Sarah Spath, who is with the Land Trust, longtime Land Trust employee and quite a wildlife specialist, will be the moderator for Ben's talk. That's on the 27th. Then April 10th, about six weeks after that, Trevor Contreras, spelled wrong there, sorry, Trevor, will give a talk on uh, the geology and art of stone carving. He's an avid stone carver when he's not a geologist for DNR. 
and he's going to focus on some Washington rocks that are commonly carved by local stone carvers. He'll, he'll, he'll highlight some of the studios and the work of accomplished local artists. This is a little bit different direction than we usually take, but it should be entertaining and educational. And then finally, we'll wrap up the spring on the 22nd of May with Jennifer Pierce, longtime young friend of mine, father and grandfather were both geologists for the USGS. She's gonna speak about wildflowers, wildfires, climate and erosion. And with our changing landscape, wildfires are, wildfires are bound to be active agents in our landscape, especially in the Cascades, the coast ranges and the Rockies. In addition, we may be into the fire, 2021 fire season by then, so it'll be particularly timely. So that's what we got coming up for the spring. Let me say a few things about our speaker today. Scott just finished his 50th year at the university level with the past 30 years at Portland State. He, taught, he has taught in Switzerland, New Zealand, Washington, Colorado, and Louisiana before returning to Portland area where he grew up. Most of those places he went are wine growing areas, you notice that. Uh, while, a while he was a student at Stanford in 1968 where he got his bachelor's and master's, he started drinking wine from a fledgling little area called the Napa Valley. So he got in early and his taste buds are cultured. He and I met in the late seventies when we were both doing graduate work under Pete Berkland at the University of Colorado in Boulder. In his professional career, Scott has concentrated on engineering geology and he recently completed a term as the president of the International Association of Engineering Geologists. That's a worldwide organization. He's a big gun in the engineering world. He's the recipient of many national science and teaching awards. Scott says he used to make wine in the early seventies with his Swiss students and turned that experience into his first published paper in the Journal of College Teaching in 1976. I would have liked to read, read that one. With the help of his large collection of students, he unlocked the secrets of the different soils in the Willamette Valley that were producing different flavored wines in the early 90s. He's also done research on terroir in Southern Oregon and the Columbia Gorge. He has also been studying Canadian terroir over the last 30 years, and he'll speak a little bit about that at the end of his talk today. Uh, today, Scott's gonna discuss the factors that affect wine flavors, terroir, concentrating on the climate and the geology of the Pacific Northwest. This is an update of, of a first lecture he gave for us in May of 2010, which Scott offered as a fundraiser that raised nearly $4,000 for us. After the formal lecture today, he'll ask what you are tasting today, where it's from, and entertain questions on the, his presentation and on terroir in general. So without further ado, may I introduce Dr. Scott Burns. Scott? Michael, I might introduce just a little bit of ado and let's uh, maybe poll our audience to figure out who's in the room before we pass it on over to Scott there. So let's do that. We wanna know who's out there and what your background is. We like to see our audience. So if you could just answer this poll, you just click on the choice that seems appropriate for you and it'll auto tabulate. And there's two questions and you'll click submit and I see the answers coming in just so we can get to know you all a little bit better. And yeah, if you have other details to share about your geologic background, feel free to toss those into the chat there as well. We're at, 90%. So we're at about 90%. So I'll give it just another second or two. And if we miss you, you can send it into the chat. So let's share the results. There we go. So we're getting, because the Zoom uh, can go anywhere, we're getting more people outside the county and more people outside of Washington. 40% of our audience is not in the Quimper Peninsula. So that's very interesting. We're still yet to retrieve anybody from the outside of the US, but if you're in Germany, this is a 4 a.m. Uh, Zoom talks, so you're probably not gonna be drinking wine at four o'clock in the morning. As far as our backgrounds, it looks like about a little over a third of us have no structured uh, teaching in geology, but there are a number of undergraduate graduate studies and a bunch of professional geologists in the audience. So we have a quite a wide and diverse uh, audience, Scott, so go to it. So Scott, 
I just pushed the button and said ask to unmute. So you should be able getting a dialogue box that'll turn on your mic for you. Not coming up. There we go. There you go. You hear me? All right. Well, tonight we're going to have some fun because geology is full of fun and wine also is. Uh, so first of all, Mike, thank you very much for the invita invitation. Thank you, Rebecca, for all you're doing behind the uh, the scenes. And wow, you guys have an incredible uh, set of uh, talks coming up. And I hope to get on uh, some of those because it's really, really good. Um, and uh, we'll have five different questions at the end, too, about what you might be sipping on and things like that. And so... Uh, that'll be coming up later on. And if you have any questions, just put them into the chat box. And when I finish uh, with the talk, uh, we will get a chance to um, uh, answer some of those. So let's see if I can uh, start in on my... Um, talk. Now, can you guys see that? Looks great. All right. Well, we are ready to go. And I'm going to minimize all my people. There we go. And so tonight what I wanted to do was talk about terroir. One of my aims in life is to turn everybody into a terroirist. And we'll explain what that magical word is coming up. And uh, here in the Pacific Northwest, we have an incredible area for growing grapes. And so I want to talk a little bit about that and the flavors that are resulting in that. And so just to give you an idea of... Let's see. Okay, let's. No, oh, there we go. Um, the, all right, we are set to go. Um, what am I going to be talking about? Get, get, give you a little bit of background uh, to terroir. And then we're going to talk about the factors that will affect uh, the flavors that are in wine. We're going to go back to France where the, the mecca of winemaking has been in the past and we continuously do that. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the impact of climate, which is so important here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the Willamette Valley where I got into talking about and learning about terroir uh, back in the early 90s. and and then I'm going to expand. I'm going to talk a little bit about Vancouver Island, which is just a hop, skip, and a jump when COVID is not there. Across, the, take the Black Ball Express over to Victoria, and there's wine tasting over there. You've got great wine tasting there in the Olympic Peninsula. I'll mention a little bit about that. End up at the end talking about Southeast Washington and make some conclusions from there. There we go. So here is a picture of me when I started teaching in Switzerland. Uh, I used to make wine with my students, and, th and that is how I started out. And here I am in the lab uh, with a whole bunch of wine. Was it any good? No. Most of it was absolutely awful. But the students got to take their bottle of wine home at Christmas time and give it to their parents and tell them that the liberal arts education that they were getting at the American College of Switzerland where I was teaching was well worth it. And then as Mike mentioned earlier, I actually um, published a paper, my first one as a professor later on. In the United States, we have had just major changes in drinking habits uh, in the last uh, 30, 40 years. If you go back to a national study of many, many hundreds of people back in 1982, Beer was the number one alcohol that people drank. Liquor, like uh, scotch, bourbon, uh, martinis, etc. And wine was way down the list. But then in 2012, look at the switch that has continued since that time. Uh, and when you go, in those days, when you went to a party, they always served hard liquor. Never, hardly any wine now. A lot of people do wine tastings. And then how many of us go out into wine country and visit wineries back in those days? It was just not a thing that was done. So there's been a major shift that is there. So every time you have a bottle of wine, um, the flavor is going to be different from the next, the next, the next, based on eight major things. First of all, the grape. And a Cabernet Sauvignon is going to be different from a Chardonnay, different from a Pinot Gris. Uh, also, here in the Willamette Valley, where we have a lot of Pinot Noir, we have 12 different clones. And so you always want to know 
what is the grape that is going into that bottle? Secondly, the, the geology that is underneath there as the, the rocks and the deposits break down into the soils, they release uh, uh, 16 major elements uh, that are very important. I'll mention these later on. Uh, and those will give different flavors. Also, the climate is so important, and we'll talk about that coming up. And then the amount of water that is in the soil, soil hydrology, all of those, and then physiography. Physiography is orientation of the slope, number one, elevation, number two. You don't want to be too high in elevation, otherwise the grapes will not uh, ripen. All of those things will affect the soil biota. And the soil biota will affect the flavor of the grapes that you have got. That is terroir. Those are those first six characteristics that are there. But there are two other factors that are also affect the flavors. And number one is going to be the winemaker. The winemaker really has the greatest influence. Do you, uh, do you use malolactic fermentation? What type of yeast do you use? How long are the skins going to be touching the particular uh, grape of the fermentation? Uh, um, uh, and then also, um, do you use oak or not? Huge decisions that are made there. And then secondly, vineyard management. Uh, do you use cover crop in between the individual rows? Um, do you have the rows going north and south? Do they go east and west? What type of trellis do you use? Lots of things like that will affect the flavors of the wine. But those first six, those affect terroir. Terroir is a French term that goes all the way back to the Burgundian monks in France. It's the total elements of the vineyard. It's the bedrock geology, the soils, the depth of the soils, drainage, color, age, all of those things. They will affect uh, the taste. And so what I, I define terroir as the taste of the place. Now the interesting thing is terroir is now being used for a lot of different things like coffee. Uh, is your uh, is your coffee going to be from Central America or is it Indonesia or places like that? Hops. Uh, if you get an IPA, all of the brewmasters are going to list where their hops are from. That's terroir. Maple syrup. I gave a talk in, at one of the four wineries in Vermont in uh, uh, 2014, and they so we use the term terroir where the actual maple syrup comes from. Cheese, the same way. And then we are doing a study at Portland State right now on the terroir of marijuana, weed. And, and for years and years, we've known the valleys in southern Oregon that have been producing the best uh, terroir. Now we're figuring out what is the soil and the climate that it leads to the best one. And all of this is best expressed in uh, transparent grapes. And I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, Dick Erath, one of the famous fathers of wine in Oregon, says 80% of the quality uh, of the wine comes from the vineyard. 20% comes from the winery. That is, the winery is going to be the winemaker. The 80% happens to be the vineyard that is terroir. If you look at a map of ma the major grape growing areas in the world, they're all basically 30 degrees north and south of uh, the, uh, the equator. Uh, and the uh, United States, Canada, southern Canada, Europe, uh, all the way over to China. China is producing huge amounts of wine right now. Is it any good? Eh, not really. If, uh, every time I go to China, I, 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 say, I sample a little bit of Great Wall Cabernet. It comes from an immaculate uh, winery just copied after one of the ones from France, but they have ways to go. Or South America, Chile, Argentina, the best Malbecs in the world are coming from there. South Africa, uh, Australia, and New Zealand, where I used to live. All of those are 30 degrees north and south. In the United States, we have wineries in every one of the 50 states. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, and going back to Burgundy, uh, France, the two major grape growing areas there are Burgundy, if you follow my little uh, pointer here, and Bordeaux. If we drew a line right through France, the northern part is going to be what we call cool climate. And then intermediate warm or warmer climate is the southern part. Uh, and so the Alsace, that's where the great Pinot Gris are grown. Uh, and Burgundy is the Willamette Valley where I'm from. Uh, in Oregon is the Burgundy of North America, uh, and uh, the great Burgundian wines, Bordeaux, the great uh, uh, mixtures that they, uh, blends that they do down there, the Rhone Valley with the great Syrahs, 
and the Rome varietal is in Provence with all of its beautiful rosés. Uh, and, and so uh, when you look at a wine label from France, it will give you the name of the winery, and it'll give you maybe the, uh, if it's from Burgundy or Bordeaux, it will have a classification, it'll give the year, the alcohol, but it does not have what wine's in it. Most of our wines that are found in the United States will tell you, is it a Cab Merlot or whatever, or a blend. Uh, the reason is you're supposed to understand terroir. If it's red and from Burgundy, you know it is Pinot Noir. If it is red and Bo from Beaujolais, you know it's going to be Gamay. If it is red and from uh, from over in Bordeaux, you know it's going to be a blend of Cabernet, uh, Merlot, and, and something else. Uh, so Burgundy here is an area where some of the initial terroir studies were done more recently. Uh, and th there's a line that goes uh, uh, in, uh, in Bur Burgundy from each one of the gro great growing areas above which you have the Grand Cru, the best uh, whites and reds year after year after year. doesn't matter who the winemaker is. It is the, the uh, of that line and then Premier Cru. And that's all based on tasting in the past. Uh, and so geologists back about 30, 40 years ago said, well, is there any notion to this? Does the geology affect it? And, and so here in this portion of the uh, Burgundy area, you can see here, there is the line. The Grand Cru is above here. Uh, and then below here is the Premier Cru and down at the bottom is the Van Ordinaire. Uh, and the, the Grand Cru is all going to be primarily um, uh, a dirty type of, uh, of limestone that you have got up in that particular area there. And then the Premier Crew is pure limestone and down at the bottom is primarily uh, the, uh, what is going to be called the uh, 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 alluvium and the stream deposits. And so there is a relationship to the geology uh, and, and the quality of the wines. The, most of the grapes that we talk about in the world today, at least our part of the, uh, the United States and Canada, is Vitus vinifera. Those are the high sugar content grapes, over 4,000 varieties. And you can see the names that we are used to, Riesling and Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, uh, Cabernet, et, et cetera, et cetera. Now let's talk about climate for a few seconds. And probably the world's greatest wine climatologist is Greg Jones. He runs the wine studies program down at Linfield University in Oregon. Uh, and he divides everything into cool climate, intermediate warm, warm and hot. And the average temperatures are listed uh, uh, in the second to the right column here. You could also do this in growing degree days. I'm not going to go into that. Basically, you're going from cool up to warm. And then the, the famous great growing areas are, for instance, cool climate is all of the German style uh, areas, the Mosul and the Rhine areas and the Alsace and Champagne, uh, the Willamette Valley, the Loire Valley, and then Burgundy. And then as you get into intermediate warm, then you get into Washington, Southeast Washington, for instance. Oh, also Western Oregon and Western Washington are cool climate areas, uh, as is Vancouver Island. Uh, and then you get into Eastern Washington and intermediate warm, Southern Oregon, Rioja, this is going to be important for the Tempranillo uh, at the end. Bordeaux is also uh, into that. And so once you get into intermediate warms, then you start getting into, uh, uh, into the um, big heavy rents uh, that you've got. Chile is another one there. And then as you get down into California, Central California, Southern California, uh, and then uh, the Rhone Valley, uh, Northern Portugal, uh, the Rhone Valley, uh, Italy, Spain, all of these are uh, your warm areas. And then you get into the hot areas like Lodi, California, Southern Portugal, and Australia. And so what are the grapes that are growing in those areas? So I've got across the top, I've got cool, intermediate, warm, warm, and hot. This is, this is all the classification of Greg Jones. Uh, and, and so the, in your cool climate areas, traditionally what you do is you grow uh, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and then the German style wines, Riesling, Gewürztraminer, Mueller, Turgau, Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, etc. Then as you move into the uh, intermediate warm, then you get into the Sauvignon Blanc, the Cab Franc, the Tempranillo, Dolcetto, Malbec, Viognier, Syrah, etc. And then as you move further to the rice, then you get into more of the heavy reds, Viognier, for instance, uh, is a white wine that, uh, from the uh, Rhone Valley that 
needs a lot of heat units that you got. And then when you get into the really hot areas, that's where your Zinfandels, your Grenache, your Nebbiolo grow. Uh, and so first thing when you start growing grapes, you say, what is my climate? And then what are the grapes that are going to be growing in those particular areas? Now, the uh, what we find is terroir differences are best expressed in your cool climate grapes. Uh, and that is when you taste two bottles that are grown on two different uh um, geological units and soils and stuff like that. Riesling is one, Chardonnay is another, and Pinot Noir for the reds. Why Pinot Noir? Well, because it is a thin-skinned red grape. Once you get into the varietals of the heavy reds, the varietal overshadows um, the, the flavors that you have got there. Now, California, for instance, they over oak their Chardonnay, and you really can't show any difference. But here in the Pacific Northwest, our Chardonnays are lightly oaked, and we're beginning to see differences in the flavors that are there. Uh, and then Riesling is making a great resurgence uh, in the Willamette Valley, mainly because you can tell the, different, the differences on the different bedrocks that you got. Now, some of us were raised on Blue Nun. You go think back into the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, when you went on a date, you wanted to uh, get your date to sip something. The more sweetness that was there, uh, they would be more willing to uh, taste. And, and so Blue Nun became very, very popular. But uh, what we have found is if you reduce the sugar and go to dry Rieslings, oh, the differences are incredible. So if you want to start a vineyard, one of the things that you really need, number one, you need to have at least 180 frost-free days a year. Secondly, you want to have low mineral nutrients. When we grow a garden, what do we do? We add fertilizer to it. You normally don't do this. Um, uh, the reason is uh, you want to stress the grapes. You want all that nutrient to go into the grapes and not into the, um, uh, uh, into the leaves and stems and leaves and stems. And so as a result, you need to have low nutrients. I'll come back to that later on. You want to, for the best grapes, you want to have well-grained soils. Perfect slope is going to be seven to eight degrees to the south, but flat is perfectly good. And then your maximum level, for instance, here in the Willamette Valley is 1,200 feet. Every place in the world is different. Colorado, they're growing grapes up to 3,500 feet uh, in elevation. And you don't want to have a lot of frost and so uh, therefore you, you have to worry about cold air drainage and then you have to worry about your minimum temperatures the willamette valley we don't have to worry about that because it will kill the plant east southeast washington big problem uh because it, it can kill the plant all the way down to the bottom especially some of those times in the winter time uh so you need to have certain elements for grape growth uh, and um, Dr. White down in Australia has told us that we need 10 macronutrients, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and chlorine. And then six micronutrients, iron, manganese, zinc, copper, boron, and molybdenum. Those last two, a, a lot of times, if you go into a vineyard and the grapes, instead of being, or the leaves, instead of being dark green, are light green, probably there's a boron or molybdenum uh, uh, deficiency there. You may have to have a spray that is used there. Now, three of those, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, come out of the water or the air. The rest of them are coming out of the soils. We also have been studying at Portland State all the trace elements that you can see here and, and their influence on some of the flavors that you have got. Terry Wright, what, a good friend of mine who used to teach at Sonoma State, did a classic uh, taste test between two vineyards of Pinot Noir in Sebastopol, Northern California, Vineyard A, Vineyard B. And everything, it was the same clone, same vineyard techniques, everything that was done there except the clay content in the soil. One was 42% clay, one was 22%, 20%. They did a blind tasting and people overwhelmingly like Vineyard B. Why? Because it was more elegant, uh, had a bigger nose, softer tannins, the, the first one had dark cherry color, deep berry, but, uh, and cherry color cola flavors, but there was a difference. And what was the only difference? It was the soil that was there. That was a terroir tasting that you have got. Uh, we did a study down, um, down in Mendoza, Argentina, the land of the Malbec. Off of the distance, you have got the uh, 
um, Akingagua, the largest volcano that is down there. And these are all alluvial fans here. And then the, the Andes are being uplifted and the streams are cutting down. And so you've got terraces. The highest terraces have got the greatest caliche. And those are the ones that have the best uh, uh, Malbec that you have got. Go over to Australia, the soils are just old, old, old. And so the uh, highly, very, very low in nutrients, a rule of thumb that we as soil scientists, like Mike, Michelle, myself, the redder the soil, the lower the nutrient level, and the better for growing grapes. So I want to shift, no, so that's the background on terroir. I want to shift and just show you a couple things that we found in Oregon, and then we will come back to Southeast uh, Washington and Northwest Washington. Uh, back in in the early 1960s, uh, David Lett was one of three winemakers that came up from uh, down uh, uh, in California, uh, and and they had all graduated uh, from the University of California at um, shoot, just east of uh, San Francisco, um, but uh, which is the mecca for winemaking. Uh, and and they they wanted to grow Pinot Noir, and all the professors say go up to Oregon, and they they came up in 1975. David Lett um, uh, uh, did not win the international Pinot Noir competition, but he took second place or third place, something like that. And all the French kept on saying, "Ooh la la, ooh a Oregon, kiss kiss say, you know, where is Oregon? What's going on here?" And that really uh, allowed people to say, wow, maybe Oregon ha can grow some great uh, ones. And so first plantings, three plantings in 1961. Now there are over 700 wineries there, 28,000 acres of it. And in, in the Willamette Valley, you've got, uh, or actually in Oregon in general, 70% of our wine is 30, is red, 30% is um, uh, white. Uh, and 60% of all of the wine in, in general is Pinot Noir. So uh, Pinot Noir is important. So the Willamette Valley are cool climate grapes. And so these are the ones that you are going to be there. I still remember back in the early 90s when I moved back to Oregon, uh, there were some wineries that were growing Cabernet. They were not very good. Why? Because those grapes never matured. Now, a lot of wineries in Oregon, uh, in the Willamette Valley, bottle uh, cabs, Merlots, Syrahs and stuff, but the, all that, all those grapes are coming from southeast Washington or southern Oregon, warmer areas. And and so how do our two states here um, compared to all of the other states in the United States? California is the uh, huge one. Uh, out of the 8,800 wineries, almost 50% of them are in California, but no, number two is Washington and number three is Oregon. Uh, now, uh, that doesn't mean volume. And if we go to volume, uh, Washington remains number three, but P Oregon goes down to number four, and New York comes up to number five. Why? Uh, they have a couple mass things like Manischewitz and Ripple and things like that. And so volume-wise, uh, New York has a lot more wine than we have got here in the Pacific Northwest. And look down here, Texas is number four. I had a chance a few years ago when I was down in Texas at San Antonio for the final four and visited 10 wineries that were just north of town. Uh, beautiful wineries, ranch style and stuff like that. Was the wine any good? No, but give them a few years and they're going to be catching up and they're going to be very, very good. So in the Willamette Valley, here's Pinot Noir. This is the king or the queen of all the grapes that we have got. And so all of your grape growing areas are divided up into what we call AVAs, American Viticultural Areas. And in Oregon now, we have 16 of them. Uh, the Willamette Valley is the major one that is here. Umpqua, which I'll be mentioning a little bit later. The road down here, Applegate. Up in the gorge, you've got the Columbia Gorge and the Columbia Valley, which we'll be talking about. And then up here in the upper right-hand corner, I'll be talking about the rocks of Milton Freewine. But in the Willamette Valley, it's now been subdivided based on terroir into seven uh, minor areas like the, the hills of Dundee uh, uh, and Yamhill County. And I'll, I'll mention some of those coming up. So terroir, uh, that is the climate and the soils are very, very important. So back in the early 90s, we decided to do a study with my grad students. Uh, and what are the wines that, uh, what are the soils that are being used? Nobody knew their soil in, in the Willamette Valley. 
But they, a lot of them said uh, they, uh, David Lett was the first guy. He did his first winery on Jory. Uh, and, and this is all the old soil conservation, name, uh, soil conservation service name, now the Natural Resource Conservation Service name. Uh, and, and lots of soil surveys out there. And so we did a study in the early 90s, and we found that the number one dominant one was the Jory soil, then the Willow Kenzie, and the Laurel Wood. And they, those three continue to be the major ones. Woodburn, which is down here, these are Missoula flood sediments. Uh, not very good for growing grapes. Uh, Jory is basalt, I'm a, uh, and this is uh, on Columbia River basalts. It's an ultisol. This is the uh, soil name. Uh, these are very, very old, red, red, red soils. It's the reddest soil in the state. Willow Kenzie is also red, as is Laurel Wood. But the Willow Kenzie, these are uplifted marine sediments of the Coast Range. Uh, and then the Laurel Wood is uh, also on basalt, but it has weathered loess, L-O-E-S-S, -S, weathered windblown silt into little piezolites that are there. Uh, and so these are, this was the story that we unfolded. So here is a map of the geology of the Northwest, Southeast Washington over here, the Columbia River basalts came out of the ground at the hot spot when the hot spot extension was here and it, the Columbia River basalts came down and is the bedrock down in this area down here. Uh, and then the uplifted, and here's the Willamette Valley that is here, uplifted along the Western edge, you get all of the, um, uplifted marine sediments, the sandstones and the shales that you've got there, uh, and then the windblown silt of the Columbia uh, of the uh, Tualatin Valley uh, is found in that particular there. So the great debate it started out Jory versus Willikenzie now has extended into the Laurelwood. Which one of those soils produces the best flavors in the Pinot Noirs and then also in the Rieslings? Is it the Jory, which is on the basalt bedrock? Is it the Willikenzie on the marine sediments? Or is it the Laurelwood with these old piezolites in there? Uh, the Missoula flood sediments, eh, not the best qualities are, uh, the, uh, that are there, especially for the red wines. And so here are the red hills of Dundee. And look at how red the soils are here. And that is our state soil. Here is a picture of our state soil. It goes down six, 10 feet of pure red soil. And it is our state soil. It took me 12 years to get it through uh, the, the state legislature. Uh, in 2011, there's a certification that is there. It was the state soil. And why do we have a state anything? The reason is we uh, kids in fourth grade in every state get the state blue book. And you get your state tree, your state rock, your state fossil, your state song. We even have a state nut in Oregon, which is the hazelnut. Uh, and, and the kids get to know all the things like that. Back in 1990, Soil Science Society of America said, we have five states with state soils. We need every state to have a sto state soil to highlight agriculture. And so they asked every state soil science society to choose that. Uh, and so it, it, it had two, two characteristics. It had to ha have high acreage, number one, and it had to be very unique. Well, we chose uh, the group with the Soil Science Society of Oregon, uh, the, um, the jory primarily is the reddest soil and it's number four in the uh, use as, as agricultural land. Number one is the Woodburn soil, Missoula flood sediment, dull brown, ugly soil. Uh, and so in 2009, my bill was it still hadn't passed, hadn't got out of committee, was voted the dumbest bill in the legislature. I was on every talk show in Portland about my dumb bill. But then two years later, we got it solved. And how did I do that? Well, in Oregon, just like in Washington, you got to unite the east side with the west side of the state. And they are different climatically. This, this soil is all on the western side of the state, primarily around the Willamette Valley. But where did it come from? It came out of the ground where Oregon, Washington, and Idaho come together. That's where the magma came that formed the soil uh, of the Columbia River basalt. And I said, this is a bill that will unite the east side with the west side. If it wasn't for the east side, we wouldn't have the magma coming out to form uh, the uh, uh, bedrock in the west and then um, uh, actually have the soil. And we um, it unites the state and it passed. Uh, here is the uh, Will Kenzie soil with a bottle of wine in there. Still very, very red, old, low nutrients, uh, but this one is on primarily uh, shale. 
And then these are the little piezolites. These are iron, magnesium, silica, uh, uh, piezolites that are there, and they give it a little feisty flavor. And the big debate is, is the laurel wood the most famous soil or becoming the uh, most famous soil? We will see. Now, people who taste wine say, well, what's the difference? Well, in the old days, it was red ver fruits versus blue fr uh, 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 dark fruits, basalt versus willow kenzie. Uh, and then the laurel wood was somewhere in between. And in the early days when you poured a Pinot Noir, I could always tell from the color if it was light red, it was going to be a Jory soil. If it was dark red, it was going to be a Willa Kenzie. So raspberries, red plums, red currants, and stuff like that versus blackberries, black cherries, black plums, and stuff like that. But Ken Wright, who was winemaker of the world by the Wine Observer or one of those uh, organizations a few years ago said, Burns, you're a geologist. You guys are used to drinking wine out of a box. What do you know about flavors? Uh, and so, therefore, it's really fruit-driven flavors in the Jory and marine sediments, more floral and spice with a little bit of lavender, cola, tobacco, cedar, and anise. Well, that's okay. But uh, I like um, Adam Campbell, um, and he is from um, o, uh, um, Elk Cove. Uh, and 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 they they make all, they have uh, vineyards in all three of the major sediments. And so, if you ever want to get a tr soil trilogy, you can go and buy and keep uh, and buy the Pinot Noirs. And it's the same winemaking, same vineyard techniques. Everything's the same except the soil. And I love setting them down on the table uh, for dinner and let people have three glasses and test and see which one goes best with them. But he says marine sediments, the uh, Willa Kenzie soil, is more black cherry and silk, whereas laurel, uh, uh, volcanic, jewelry down at the bottom, more red uh, uh, red pie, cherry, and spice, so red versus dark. And then laurel wood is uh, in between blue fruit and earthy. The, pro the thing is, every winemaker has different descriptions, but the bottom line is the soil affects the flavor that you've got in Rieslings. And now we're, because we're uh, oaking things less than the Chardonnays, we're getting similar things coming out. So that's a story from the Willamette Valley. How about Southern Oregon? Oh my God, things are really, un uh, the Umpqua area down there and then the Rogue Valley, the Applegate uh, are producing incredibly good wines. The number one wine that is coming out of there is um, um, uh, is Tempranillo, uh, which come, uh, comes from the Rioja area of, um, of Spain. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, and then, uh, so, uh, so uh, and I'll talk a little bit later also about the Columbia Gorge. So now let's come back up to your area where you, for the majority of you, live. And I, I, we're going to ask you a, a question later on. You know, how many of you have gone across over to Vancouver Island where there are 34 wineries? In the, in the area between Victoria and Nanaimo uh, is the Coacan uh, Valley. 34 wineries that are there. Now, they're all cool climate estate uh, vineyards. Uh, they do have a state wine, and the state wine is going to be Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, Rosé, um, Petit Milo. I don't know that grape at all. Gewürztraminer, Waxero, that is from the um, Alsace area. A grape, a, a very good wine from the uh, Alsace area. Sparkling wines, and then Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir and some of the other ones, those are grapes that are imported primarily from the Okanagan Valley. Uh, and this happens in Washington, too where southeastern uh, grapes, the big heavy reds, come, come over to the wineries here. And some of the my favorite ones, Enrico Winery, uh, Unsworth, and Averill Creek, but there are 34 of them. And so once COVID is over and once you can actually go across the border to Canada, I encourage you, go over and taste some of these places because they are producing some pretty good wines that are there. Here is a map of Canada. Major grape growing areas that you've got, Niagara, right next to Niagara Falls, huge area. Uh, and Rieslings are a, a big one there. And then also the grapes that I mentioned before, ice wines, uh, where they can actually get the freezing of the grapes on the wines and then um, producing the sweet uh, after dinner ones. Uh, the major grape growing other area in Canada, other than that one is the Okanagan. Oh, it's a great area, I'll show you a picture of it. I love going up there. And then thirdly, uh, Vancouver Island. And so uh, those are things to think about. 
And so here is Western Canada and the grape growing areas from Kelowna all the way down past Penticton uh, and Oliver and then in the Nanaimo to Victoria. So something to think about after COVID is over. And here's a picture of Okanagan, great wineries, beautiful views. Their biggest problem is they keep having forest fires up there, uh, which is not very good for the, the grape. And then here up there, uh, for, for you guys on the Olympic Peninsula, uh, I've got a couple favorites, Port Towns and Vineyards and then Camaraderie Cellars. Mike turned me on to both of those. They're wonderful. They, uh, they, many of them have estate vineyards, and so they're going to be growing similar white grapes uh, that are there. And then a lot of the more red grapes are being imported from southeastern Washington. And so support your local guys. Again, cool climate area and wonderful people. And so the main differences between Washington and southeast Washington is that 95% of the vineyards are on Missoula flood sediments. Uh, and they control the, uh, uh, and, and whereas in Oregon, especially the Willamette Valley, 90% of the vineyards are on the upland areas, they're the red soils, only 10% are on the Missoula flood sediments. Now, uh, you say, wait a second, aren't Missoula flood sediments loaded with uh, nutrients? And they are. They are loaded with calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. Uh, and they are great for growing things. We thank the, uh, all of us in the Willamette Valley, thanks, thank Washington every time we go driving up and down because Missoula flood sediments that have been brought by the Missoula floods down between 15 and 18,000 uh, calendar years ago. And they form the heart of our agriculture and they are nutrient rich. But uh, how do we reduce the vigor? Well, we stay off of those get onto the red soils, and in Oregon, in the Willamette Valley, we do not irrigate. Very, very important. So we have to have soils to control uh, the, the vigor that you have got. Whereas in Washington, in Southeast Washington, they've got to irrigate all of those. And so that, that's how they control the vigor. Uh, is by giving just enough water to keep the plants alive. And that's and 95 percent of the the vineyards are either on Missoula flood sediments or the loose, the windblown silt coming off of the Missoula flood sediments that we have got. Uh, I want to put in a word for the Columbia Gorge, which is a, uh, basically from Hood River all the way up to the Dalles. And it's its own ABA. Half of it's in Washington, half of it's in Oregon. Uh, and it is classic because you go from Underwood Mountain, which is one of these small little boring lava volcanoes on the Washington side, uh, all the way up to the Dalles. And you go from Burgundy to Bordeaux in 20 miles. You're going from cool climate all the way up to warm climate uh, in 20 miles. And so the diversity of, of the wines, you're going to get the German style ones and the Chardonnays and the Pinot Gris and Pinot Noirs on Underwood Mountain. And then when you get up to... Uh, up to the Dalles, you have got Cabs, Merlots, and Syrahs, and just incredible. And if you're looking for a great winery, uh, and I know somebody's drinking it, Sincline Winery, James and Poppy, who own that on the Washington side. I mean, as geologists, we love Sinclines, and uh, uh, they're mostly Rhone varietals. So that's something to think about. And then let me just talk a little bit about southeastern um, or uh, Washington, Walla Walla Valley. We're going to talk a lot about that in a second. Then Prosser area, the Yakima Valley that you've got here, Tri-Cities, Waluke Soap. And then Alderdale, which is down here. I'll show you a picture uh, from a vineyard there. But the Great Missoula Floods, and I'm sure that most of you are familiar with it, between 15 and 18,000 years ago, a ice dam... Uh, uh, dammed up the major river draining uh, western, uh, eastern, uh, western Montana, Clark Fork River, created a lake that went all the way back to Missoula, we, which we call Glacial Lake Missoula. Uh, at 530 cubic miles of water, it was released when that dam broke and it came across eastern Washington, scouring out all the basins, cre creating the Channel Scablands. All that water came back into the Columbia River at Wallula Gap, came down. It, through the gorge, the gorge had all been there for 20 plus million years, uh, and then through Portland out into the uh, uh, ocean and then filling up the Willamette Valley. And then the dam reformed, uh, the lake reformed. We had at uh, least uh, 89 uh, lakes uh, that uh, eventually broke 
and came down, scoured out Eastern Washington, uh, and and relocating a lot of the uh, the sediment uh, downstream. One area that is down uh, cl uh, down in the area close to uh, Pasco, I love is uh, Red Mountain. This is a sub AVA in Eastern Washington. It's all Missoula flood sediments that are up there. And I love the grapes that come from that particular area. Here's a picture of some grapes. Look at those. I think those are cabs uh, uh, that are there. Uh, I, one of my guru, uh, good friend, Alan Busaka, uh, he and Larry Minert were the gurus, the terroir guru, gurus, Southeastern uh, Washington for many, many years. Um, now, Kevin Pogue has taken over. Alan has his own vineyard down in the Columbia Gorge, and Larry Minert's moved back to uh, Washington, D.C. And look at the uh, incredible Missoula flood sediments in the, uh, that are in back there, uh, typical of the Red Mountain area, uh, and it grows grape, grape, grope, <laughs> grapes, grapes. Uh, and then over in the Acoma area and the Prosser area, um, here is a vineyard uh, here. You can see the Missoula flood sediments that are there. How do we prove that it's Missoula flood sediments? Well, look at, you got ice rafted granite. There's no granite around here. And it's been ice rafted in on that uh, um, ice dam that broke up when they, all that flood, flood water was released. And then when you come down to the Columbia Valley, Columbia Crest has huge numbers of vineyards. Uh, this is Oregon over here on the right-hand side, Washington here. Here's the Columbia River and the combination of the south-facing slopes and great soils in there, great uh, wines that are produced down there. Prosser, great wines that are over here. You got the heat units that are over there. Walla Walla Valley, oh, great wines that are being produced over there. Uh, I want to mention uh, an incredible AVA that has developed just in the last 20 years. Uh, and uh, it is probably the hottest AVA in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and it is called the Rocks of Milton Free Water. Uh, it's right on the boundary between Oregon and Washington. Uh, and uh, and it uh, has very, very unique soils. Kevin Pogue uh, at Whitman College helped all of the winemakers establish that as a um, uh, AVA. There are 19 vineyards there, over 250 acres of vineyards. Uh, only one soil series, and it is a f the free water series. Uh, and and it, so it's highly uh, concentrated in that area. I threw the name in for, for Mike Machette. It's a fluventic haplozerol, uh, which means that it's mostly flood sediments. It's, the, uh, it's coming primarily from the uh, Walla Walla River. But uh, Christophe Barone made a discovery, and I'll show you a picture of him, and he owns Cayuse Winery Vineyards in just a second. Most of the grapes that are grown there are Syrah, incredibly ones, and it's all gravels and cobbles, and mostly basaltic ones. Here's a picture of Christophe. I was in the vineyard with him um, many years ago with Alan Busaka, and if you look down on the ground, that's what the soil looks like. And he was, he was French, uh, and he wanted to come to the Walla Walla Valley and he wanted to establish and buy some vineyard property. And, and he said, um, a, a real estate agent was taking him around and he said, oh, it's going to be $20,000 an acre here, $20,000. And as they were going from Washington into Oregon, he said, how about this property here? And he said, oh, the real estate agent said, oh, it's farmland. It's just gravel and cobble. You don't want this. He said, let's stop. He goes over and takes a look at it, and he says, how much is it? It was way less, way less. And he said, I'll take it. And he, bit, he, he got his first vineyard, and he planted it. Why did he do it? The reason is, this is what Bordeaux looks like. Bordeaux it does, it has very, very few fine-grained soils. Back in the 1700s, when the Nouveau Reach was trying to uh, buy land, there was no land that was there. So they hired the Dutch to come down into that area and, and uh, put levees on the, the rivers and uh, reclaimed all the wetland soils like this, and that's where your best uh, uh, Bordeaux wines are coming from. He knew that, and he knew that it would produce a great wine. And, and so he started Cayuse Winery, uh, and uh, now the only way to buy his wine, there is no tasting room. The reason is you have to get onto a mailing list and then hope that you can actually get onto the buying list sometime in the future. His Syrahs are just out of this world. He's got a lot of other wines that he produces too. Why am I showing you a picture from Rioja, Spain? Because my sipping wine that I'm going to be drinking tonight 
uh, is uh, uh, from Southern Oregon. Uh, it's a Tempranillo uh, from Abacella, the number one winery in the uh, southern part of the state of Oregon. And so we're going to be talking about that uh, in just a second. So if you fell asleep during my talk, what did I talk about? I talked about the importance of terroir, the eight factors that will, uh, that will affect it, but the six that form terroir, those first six, uh, those will affect the flavors that you have got. Willamette Valley, we control vigor by old soil, Southern Oregon and Eastern Washington, they control vigor by irrigation. Uh, Willamette Valley are cool climate grapes, uh, so the Pinots, German style wine, Chardonnay, and you want to keep off the uh, Missoula flood sediments, whereas Eastern Washington, Southern Oregon, it's warm climate and grapes like Merlot, Cabernet and Syrah. Uh, and uh, it's my aim that every time you go into a tasting room, you will ask, what is the year of the, the grape, especially in cool climate areas? What are the clones that are being used, especially in, in the cool climate areas? And what is the soil? Because all three of those are going to be affecting them. Used to be in Oregon, we would always ask what is the year because a lot of times the, it was too cool, cool and uh, not very good. Uh, but now as the climate is warming, we're getting good years year after year. So with that, I, I, I christen all of you terroirists. It's time to go forth and go out and taste wines and taste the different uh, terroirs. And so with that, I'm going to end my talk. And then if you have any questions, put them into the chat box. Uh, and then uh, we'll answer a few questions and then we're going to go around and see what everybody is or what some of you are uh, drinking and what is the terroir of those. So thank you very much. Okay. Rebecca. Uh oh. Sorry. That's okay. So Rebecca, are you with us? There she is. Uh, we have just a few questions. I'm sure there'll be more coming in, but uh, Jim Masson, I don't know Jim, but I see his picture here somewhere. He said, can we get a decent kosher wine in Oregon? What do we do? Wow, and that's a, I've never had anybody ever ask me that question and I don't know the answer. So um, maybe somebody else knows the an answer and they can actually put in the chat and then we can have that person do that. I, I've i never been asked that question. Good, okay. good, good one to ask. So you got another one here. Uh, does Washington have a state soil? Uh, Washington does. And it, I don't know if it's actually gone. So every state does have a, a state soil. Uh, about 70% uh, of them have gone through, gone through the legislature. It's a hassle uh, to take it through the, the legislature. And, um, and so I don't know... Uh, I should have I should have looked it up. I, I know it. Uh, I did know it, but I don't know it now. I'm sure somebody out there will Google it while we talk. Yes, that'd be that'd be good. And if they do put it in the chat box, that'd be great. Uh, here's another one. What is vigor and why is it controlled? What do they mean by vigor? OK, so vigor uh, means uh, uh, the plant just goes wild uh, and it, it, it all goes back to um, nutrients, calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, nitrogen, uh, and fertilization. And so if you want to increase the vigor of any plant that you have got, then you fertilize. Uh, or you have soils that are naturally rich in all of those nutrients that I mentioned before. When you go and uh, tra travel in eastern Washington, you will see a lot of vineyards that look very, very nice and cut and everything. And then you're going to see some vineyards where the vines are growing everywhere. Those are mostly grapes that are going to go into Welch's grape juice. Eastern Washington produces huge amounts of that. And they let the grapes go wild. They don't cut back on them, uh, cut back to two tons an acre, or three tons an acre, or whatever it is. And, and that's vigor. They are just letting them go wild. And they actually do fertilize some of those ones. So uh, vigor is a huge deal. Um, it's a great question. OK. What is the old Swiss way of producing wines? What's, a, what's the ancient way of making wines? Do you have anything to say about that? Uh, uh, from Switzerland? Switzerland, or let's say European wines. Well, if, a lot of times, you know, what, what do you make the, uh, what do you ferment the um, actual grapes in? Uh, and a lot of the early fermentation tanks were 
cement and concrete and um, uh, ceramic uh, ones. An interesting thing that is happening right now, a lot of winemakers, especially who make white wines, are buying concrete eggs. They're in the shape of an egg. They're all concrete. And my favorite Pinot Gris last year was from Lang, and it was Jesse Lang made his uh, one batch of Pinot Gris in the concrete egg, and it just knocked my socks off and a lot of other people. And, and so what you, because most of your white wines are done in stainless steel tanks, and now everybody's going back to these uh, uh, cement. Yeah, Mike. Okay, here's another one. What type of soil is found in the Applegate area of Oregon, specifically around the Trone Winery? Do you know that? Is that <laughs> specific? Oh, and I should know that because I got invited by all the Southern wineries to, to visit every one of the vineyards in, uh, um, in, in the Applegate, in the Rogue, uh, in the Illinois Valley and in the um, uh, uh, Umpqua Valley. And I have all that information around there. Um, most, uh, uh, most of the uh, vineyards that you've got in the Applegate are on alluvial soils. So alluvial fans instead of the bedrock that is up the steep slopes. Uh, and, um, but boy, do they produce some absolutely wonderful uh, grapes in the Applegate Valley. And so if, if somebody wants to email me that later on, give me the name of the winery and I'll tell you exactly what soils are uh, found in that particular area because I, I put we'll things that search. When we're done, we'll bring Scott's contact information up on the last screen so you can just jot down his email and flood him with your favorite terroir or winery questions. He won't get anything done for a year. Yeah. Here's another question. You didn't mention the Madeline Angel Vine, which is a common... Uh, I, I presume uh, wine in the Puget area at the Lopez Island Vineyard. Is it not one you favor or is it not one you even know? It's, it, it's one that I don't even know. And uh, it's a good question. Um, it, it could be one of these American hybrid wines uh, that is, uh, as you get into cooler climates, um, especially in the Midwest, for instance, uh, where it gets colder and colder, you have these. Uh, hybrid vines they're a combination of american stock and uh, european stock um, and uh, there are a whole bunch of names that go along with it one is marichal foch uh, which is actually uh, uh, it's, it produces a heavy red wine uh, but it produces it in cool climates and uh, uh, another one the the major red wine that is produced in the mid upper midwest is norton and it's an, uh, one of these American hybrids. So it could be that it's one of those American hybrid wines. Uh, and so I don't, I'm not aware of it. Okay, here's one that'll test you, trace element area. Um, are there any concerns over transuranic ions? I think he's talking about radon in Southeast Washington soils and wines from radioactive releases. You so know, nobody has actually looked at that. And I've done a huge amount of work in radon uh, and we mapped all the radon in the Portland, Vancouver area. In fact, the whole state of Oregon. Uh, and uh, especially, especially along the Columbia River would be something to take a look at, um, uh, especially with Richland and um, what's happening up river. So the, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, so we, we have some serious terrorists out here, I can tell. Yeah. Would, we would like your view on Alex Maltman's sense of terroir and its impact. Oh, I love it. Uh, and um, so Alex Maltman, um, a British dude, and uh, he um, just does, uh, he does not believe in a lot of the, the terroir stuff that we put out and, and minerality. And, um, and, and so, uh, Greg Jones and I have had had good discussions with uh, Alex Maltman um, uh, throughout the years. In fact, uh, we have the Geological Society of America meeting coming up in Portland again this year. He was there back at, uh, when we had the last meeting and he gave a talk on that. Um, he just doesn't believe in some of the things that I was talking about tonight, but uh, the story we put together from the Willamette Valley uh, um, holds up. Maybe he's been drinking too much English wine. <laughs> okay, here's one, uh, and this is fitting. What will climate change do to our wines in the future? Oh, I love it. Great question. I should. I, I normally talk about it, and I didn't talk about it earlier. 
um, it, go back to the the the, uh, the climate chart. I had cool climate, intermediate warm, warm and hot. If you start out in the cool climate, you just start planting the next set of grapes uh, as you get into um, so uh, the lower elevation in the Willamette Valley, which is traditional cool climate grapes. Uh, what you do is all of it, not all, but many of the winemakers at the lowest elevation vineyards just above the Missoula floods, they are planting Tempranillo uh, and the cool climate variety of Syrah right now. Uh, and they are maturing. And, and, and this is wonderful. And so you just move to the next. But what if you are in the Napa Valley? Greg, Greg Jones, a, a wine climatologist I mentioned before, uh, you're already growing a huge number of Zinfandels, and Zinfandel is the end of the, the line. Uh, and so you can, there's not much uh, else that you can move to. I mean, it could be within time, the whole uh, Napa Valley and Sonoma Valley will all be Zinfandel. So, raisins. Yep, yeah, and raisins. Yeah, that's right. Okay, somebody asked, what is a clone? You mentioned clones of grapes. All right, uh, and so uh, a clone is a genetic type of turn. Uh, and... Um, that is the, the Pinot Noir, for instance, has a good cousin, Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Meunier. Uh, all of these are changes in the genetic structure that they still can interbreed with one another, but they are distinctively different and different pictures. Uh, I mean, Pinot Gris, which is a pink grape, uh, and Pinot Noir, which is a reddish grape, uh, they're cousins. Of one, they uh, both came originally from the Pinot Noir. Uh, and so they are uh, varietals uh, of the of the individual grape uh, plant that you've got. Okay, uh, let's see. Which winery was it that you had three different soils shown? I don't recall. Oh, oh yeah, there, there are about four or five of them. Uh, so I got uh, Elk Cove is, is one of my favorites. Lang is another one. Uh, Shehalem is a third one. And Brooks is another one. All of them, you can go in, you can, uh, you can taste the three different terroirs with the same winemaker, same vineyard manager, and everything. And then uh, Brooks and, uh, and Shehalem also do a similar set with the Rieslings, too. Okay, here's uh, the Google, Google at work. Pat Pringle and Art and Sharon Storvo answered the question about the Washington State soil. Good. It's a tokel. It's one rich in volcanic ash. Okay, Tokel. 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 All right. And maybe a final question before we find out what people have been drinking or what they're working on in their second bottle by now. Uh, do you know anyone that's growing grapes on till? Good. Well, up in the Okanagan Valley, uh, a lot of it's on till. Uh, um, in Oregon, well, uh, in the Midwest, I mean, most of the wineries that are found in the Midwest are grown on, uh, on till. And so, but out here in Oregon and Washington, uh, you, to get the, most of the till is high, high enough in elevation, probably can't do that. Uh, and just, I, I will end with one last, uh, 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 mini story about, I visited the second largest winery in Missouri. I was giving a talk at, uh, uh, Missouri uh, Institute of Science and Technology and did engineering geology in the morning and, the, and in the afternoon a terroir talk but the um, they took me to the second largest winery and it was neat because the guy who was there was uh, Kiwi and he had studied at Lincoln College where I used to teach in uh, uh, um, in New Zealand and he uh, and so we tasted his white wines. White wines are good, a little sweet, but not too bad. And then we tasted his Norton red wine. And I said, uh, whoa, this is different. And I, I, I said, what is the residual sugar of this? You know, most sweet wines maybe are 2 to 3%, uh, uh, unless you're dessert wines. It was 10% residual sugar. And he said, uh, he said, I don't like making it, but everybody here likes sweet wines, and we sell 50,000 cases of this every year, and so I have to make it this way. Uh, and, and so the Midwest seems to like their wines a little more, uh, little more sweet than we do out here in the West. And so, um, so I will end with that. And so, Mike, do, do we want to go around and, and, and see what people are drinking and then uh, discuss the terroir.
you know, Rebecca. Oh, has, we have sorry, we have some polls. Yep, this is this is easy and it's quick, you guys. There's two questions here. What what type of wines do you prefer versus what are you drinking tonight? And just go ahead and hit the one you like and it'll auto tabulate. So go. And keep on scrolling down. There's a few. We have five questions for you, but they're all easy. I can see what some folks are drinking tonight. Keith was uh, holding up his bottle for us there earlier. And I know some folks have already been typing into the chat, but if you want to get more specific and let us know what, what you're drinking tonight and add some more detail there, that would be great. Oh yeah, and I see some bottles being held up. Not super easy to read, but I like it. Cheers to us all. So keep on going on those polls, folks, and we'll I'll share the results once we get about 85% folks reporting. And lots of people are responding about the particulars of their wine. If you look in the chat, Mm -hmm. yeah. you can see who's doing what and who's drinking the box wine and who's not. <laughs> Pat Pringle, a previous speaker from two months ago, is drinking a Tuscan Wallback. Good for you, Pat. So Bill okay. is- Okay, I'll share the poll results with you all. All right, let's see what, yeah, good. Here it comes. So it looks like heavy reds won out on question one there as far as preference yeah. and as far as what folks are drinking tonight. So folks are drinking what they like, which is good. Yeah, three, four spread. Yeah. And Washington local varieties seems to be what is in people's glasses tonight as well. Um, also, some NAs, I'm guessing uh, some folks do not have a glass with them right now. Yeah, what else are you seeing in those results, Scott or Michael? Anything popping out to you? I lost mine. Could you give it back to me? Pardon? You're, I, you can speak, I, Scott. Huh? You can speak. I, but I, I lost the poll. I only saw the first two results. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't try offer. that again. That's okay. Got it now? Yeah, but how do you? Just there leave it on the right side. Okay, there we go. Okay. So interestingly, uh, seven of 10 people have drunk wines from the Olympic Peninsula. So they're they're buying local. That's a good thing. That's Maybe good. They, yeah. And I think our wines are getting better year by year. Camaraderie has won quite a few gold medals. And I th Marlstone is on the uptick right now, too. They're getting quite a name for uh, local wines. Don Corson probably has something to say about that. He mentored. There he is. I see him right there with Amy Hartsell. Uh, he was m mentoring uh, Jim. What was Jim's last name? Can't remember now. At Marrowstone. Yeah, I can't remember his last name either, but he's great. And have you tried a wine produced on Vancouver Island? It looks like uh, two, one out of three people or so have tried it. I think I've had one when I was in Cochin once, but it's not on my buying list yet. Okay. James Holloway is the name of the person at Marrowstone Vineyards. There we go. It's yeah. great to have this hive mind in the chat here. So I'll pull those results down. Thank you to all of you for filling out that poll. It's, it's great to see uh, such a diversity. Uh, so I think we're about at the end of this, Scott. It was a fascinating educational talk and I appreciate this is the third time he's been here. He's come down about every five years. So put it on your calendar. 2026, he'll be back again. 
maybe in person. <laughs> and I appreciate all the people that have showed up today. We had about 90, 90 participants at the height. So any further comments? Anything for you to say, Rebecca? Well, I was going to talk, you know the future events. They're on our website. We already talked about them. And contact information for Scott. Do you want to put that up, Rebecca? Yeah, sure. So Scott has graciously agreed uh, to field some questions later on. And his contact info is available to you all. And here I go. I will paste it in the chat for you. I'm having trouble with my screen share right now, which is no fun. Also, somebody asked, where do they find the recording to? Okay. Yes, and so I put a link into the chat before and I'll do it again here for you. Um, if you are signed up on the Quimper Geological Society mailing list, we'll send you a link to the recording there and it will also be on quimpergeology.org uh, starting probably tomorrow afternoon once we get it cleaned up. Uh, if, you, if you go to our website and look at the events, this is an event. If you look at the recordings, you can go right to Scott's recording from there. So it's very direct. Okay. So unless there's further questions, I'd like to say good evening to you. Sorry about the Seahawks. They went down in flames 23 to 13. Can't win them all. Okay. Oh, and we're having some, uh, we're having some thank you claps. You see that? Thank you, Scott. Well, thank you for the invitation, Mike. And, uh, Rebecca, you did a wonderful job, and can I really enjoy uh, listening to these talks, so I look forward to a couple of ones coming up, too. Okay. Bye, everybody. Take care, everyone. Good night.